So folks, right now is a very interesting moment. A whole bunch of stuff is happening with regard to old Donnie. And in those moments, some things, often really big things, fly under the radar. And so on this very night, there are a few legal outcomes for Trump, all of them terrible, that everyone is talking about, but also another at the highest court of the land, at the Supreme Court, where Trump just suffered a historic defeat that no one is talking about including the fact that his best buddy Clarence Thomas just told Trump and his movement to F off in a private meeting. Guys, it's really heating up, but this is based also on his wider legal desperation because tonight we not only got critical insight into just how broke Donald Trump is becoming as a result of his legal fees, but also some critical insight from the Georgia grand jury, some brand new information that all but says that Donald Trump and others have been recommended for major, substantial, numerous criminal charges. And we're going to get to that. Let's start with the legal fees, because this really outlines how all of the money that Trump has been supposedly raising for his political action committee has basically been bled dry by legal fees. Trump's political action committee actually spent on legal bills last year. Sure. So it, the, the Political Action Committee, over the two years in which it was formed, it was formed at the very end of 2020, spent overall uh, nor, more than $16 million on legal fees, roughly $10 million of that, you know, uh, some increase over that number, but, but not a huge amount, went directly to Trump's legal fees. And for the most part, these were legal fees in, in cases that had nothing to do with politics. It was, you know, the, the investigation in Manhattan into the Trump Organization and representation there. It was the representation defending him in the Justice Department investigation that's ongoing into his uh, possession of hundreds of, of classified documents and other presidential records. Uh, and the list goes on, and it's a, it's a huge constellation of lawyers. It's striking for two reasons, Wolf. I mean, three. One is just the sheer volume. One is the fact that Trump is notorious for not paying lawyers on his own, which gets to the third issue, which is that there is a, some unsettled debate over whether now that he's a candidate, he can still use that PAC money to pay his own personal legal fees. And so it notes there that the money's barely been spent at all on the actual things that you would expect somebody that's doing political action to spend the money on. Rallies and events and campaign materials and policy and uh, lobbying and all these sorts of things that you would think that, oh, you're running a Make America Great Again pack. You'd be spending on the money on political initiatives to make, in your mind, whatever it is, America great again. And of course, we would disagree, but like, you know, they might spend money on holding events to address taxes or immigration. All all of that stuff never really happened. What did happen was Trump was forced to spend all of that money on his own personal legal battles because at the end of the day, that's what's been dominating his life. Like he hasn't really been able to push a political narrative because for the last two years, but especially the last six months to a year, everything's ramped up. The case around J6, the case around the documents, the Georgia stuff, the New York civil case, the New York criminal case, which may come up, the stuff against his company, all of these things are draining his energy, his attention, his momentum, and his bank account. But when it comes to Georgia, we got some really interesting info today, both from general reporting, but also two critical interviews with somebody from the heart of that grand jury that say everything. And this feeds directly into the fact, guys, that Donald Trump's Supreme Court defeat tonight, today, was so devastating. It was maybe the most devastating defeat he could get because we understand, guys, that without the White House, without the presidency, nothing can save him from the looming criminal trouble that's about to bear down on him. But listen to this giving a general recap. We have breaking news from the Associated Press and the New York Times. The four women in the special grand jury investigating Donald Trump's potential election interference in 2020 has given an on-the-record interview to both news organizations, telling the Times the jury recommended multiple indictments. It's not a short list, she's quoted as saying. Asked whether Donald Trump was one of them, she responded, you're not going to be shocked. It's not rocket science. And adding, you won't be too surprised. Joining me now is MSNBC legal analyst Lisa Rubin. Um, you know, not to, to you know guess at what she's talking about there, but... It's not so veiled. 
It's not, Katie. And she told the Associated Press this morning that she had been instructed, as had the other grand jurors, about what they could and could not say by Fulton County Superior Court Judge Robert McBurney. I wonder right now if, in reading the New York Times report, Judge McBurney believes that Emily Kors overstepped. She certainly was careful this morning with the Associated Press, talking about sketches she made of various witnesses, who was funny, who was unhappy to be there, who might have invoked privilege. But in telling the Times that the grand jury indeed recommended indictments and that it wouldn't be rocket science to guess who they recommended indictments against, I wonder whether she overstepped that line today. Um, she also tells the Times that they started in the grand jury with that call that Donald Trump made to Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, where he asked Raffensperger to find the votes he needed to win that state, 11,780 votes. And here's what she told the Times. We definitely started with the first phone call, the call to Secretary Raffensperger that was so publicized. I will tell you that if the judge releases the recommendations, it's not going to be some giant plot twist. You probably have a fair idea of what may be on there. I'm trying very hard to say that delicately. It seems to only underscore what I asked you at the top, which is that it doesn't seem like it's so veiled. No, it doesn't seem like it's so veiled at all. But also, I think what Ms. Kors might be getting at is how far reaching this investigation was and what acts or conduct might be at issue in the grand jury's recommendations. We know from the outset that when Fonnie Willis started her investigation and asked for a special grand jury to be appointed, one of the things she was most interested in from the very outset was that call. The investigation then expanded to include things like Lindsey Graham's call to Secretary of State Raffensperger in mid-November, and then expanded to include things like the fake electors scheme and Georgia's involvement in that, as well as accusations about the voting machines and whether or not they had been penetrated or hacked or somehow involved in the fraud. We know that the grand jury didn't buy those allegations. They say, and the now unredacted portions of the report, there was no widespread fraud that could have overturned the results of the election. But I think she's also basically saying the things you understand to be the central points of this investigation, those are indeed where we focused our energies. You know, I think that's critical because at this juncture, we, we, we are starting to get a sense that something is brewing in Georgia. As I've said and many others have said, it's likely the case that there wouldn't just be perjury charges because what was redacted from the document was most of it. And there was a lot of things that weren't related to the perjury charges that, that they recommended against people. And so that leads many to believe, reasonably so, that there are other non-perjury charges and likely more than one of them. And the reason they didn't show the names of anyone was because there were specific people, of course, connected to specific charges. But all of that was sort of conjecture, right? Like that was a reasonable guess that we could make and legal experts could make, observers could make. But tonight, in a really interesting interview, it was all but made clear that what we were thinking is probably correct and there aren't, aren't any big surprises coming. Of that Georgia grand jury speaking out for the first time, which feeds questions and speculation tonight about who exactly is now being potentially recommended for indictment there. This is the first ever inside account of the inner workings of the Georgia grand jury. If you're thinking, well, you've heard a lot about it. You've heard about the report. We've covered it. I'm just going to tell you this once because this is the only time I'm going to say it because this is the only time it's happened first. This is the first time we've had a grand juror speak out. And at that, the foreperson. This is the only known state criminal probe into Trump's election activities. The jury's leader, or foreperson, now today for the first time speaking out in a series of interviews, first to the AP, then to the New York Times, and it is making waves, announcing for the first time the fact that she says this grand jury recommended indictments for multiple people on a range of charges. Now, after what felt like a sudden set of print interviews. I mean, people woke up in the legal and news world today going, oh, the four person speaking out? The legal world, the Trump world, everyone went into overdrive. I could tell you that. And NBC's Blaine Alexander got the big TV news interview here with the four person, Emily Kors. Here's an excerpt of the big interview. It's not a short list. More I than... mean, we saw 75 people and there are six pages of the report cut out, mm. I think. If you look at the page numbers, mm -hmm. so it's not. 
So we're talking about more than a dozen people? I would say that, yes. Okay. Are these recognizable names, names that people would know? There are certainly names that you would recognize, yes. There are names also. Now that sounds pretty definitive to me. You know, she's being careful, the foreman of that grand jury, not to actually come out and say it, but she's saying there shouldn't be any big surprises. And what that means is we would expect, given the evidence, given her body language, given the way she's talking, that there are more than one charges. It's a long list, which, you know, corroborates the fact that there was a pretty hefty document, most of which was blacked out, except for a small section at the beginning and at the end, which means that, like, obviously behind all those black bars and all of that was some really juicy info. But, you know, obviously, I think they recommended charges against Trump, and that's what she's trying to say. And she sort of reiterates that, I think, in another interview with a different source. Is former President Trump. Of course. Did you recommend charges against Donald Trump? I really don't want to share something that the judge made a conscious decision not to share. I, I will tell you that it was a process where we heard his name a lot. Uh, we definitely heard a lot about former President Trump. And we definitely discussed him a lot in the room. And I will say that uh, when this list comes out, you wouldn't, there are no major plot twists waiting for you. You know, it's interesting. We, that just raises more questions of course. I know, of I know, I'm sorry. No, no, do, please do not apologize. <laughs> I'm very appreciative of your time. When you say there's no plot twists and you know people won't be shocked, People are gonna people are gonna hear that and they're gonna think that means that Donald Trump is definitely on that list. Um, I know. It's and and this is where we're at. Trump is. I think he's gonna be. There's gonna be charges recommended against him. Now we should be clear. Um, Fonnie Willis doesn't have to listen to this grand jury. The steps at this point are she's got this document that's recommending charges against multiple people and it's a long list. I think Trump's on it. I think she's saying Trump is on it without saying Trump is on it and other people as well. But she still has to go to a traditional grand jury to confirm the charges. And of course, she doesn't have to bring every single charge or even any of them to that committee, uh, to that grand jury. But this is the single biggest step we've seen toward towards Trump being charged at any point. Uh, you know, in terms of personal criminality. And it's coming at a time where him and his acolytes, they just took a big defeat because a movement of Trumpers is trying to reinstall him via the Supreme Court yet again, guys. Just today, they lost a major case and it included a fact that unanimously, including the buddy of Trump, Clarence Thomas, one of his best bros, told them to F off and get away in their private deliberations. It says here, a trio of pro-Trump activist brothers are teasing that they have a plan C to get former President Trump reinstated to office after the Supreme Court again smacked down the legal case. In a Facebook post, they noted that their effort was again rejected and all but ending their already slim chance to, that the current President Joe Biden would be removed from the White House. Their second petition denied it goes on to say that they have another new, maybe even crazier plan. But this, of course, is another one of these legal efforts from Trump world. Some of them by Trump himself, some of them by people connected to him indirectly, all of these sorts of things. But this is still a defeat for Trump, because if these guys succeeded in getting him back on the court, they would, of course, put him back on. But what this means is they were rejected unanimously without explanation, which means in the private deliberative meetings, Clarence Thomas and the other eight judges all said to Trump and his crony movement, screw off, F off, stop wasting our time. We're done with you. And we have, we have more important things to deal with. We want to do awful things, Clarence Thomas said. We want to do evil things. And Donald Trump and his cronies are ruining that. And Trump is devastated when he sees things like this. Even if they're not his own cases, he is still defeats and he tracks these cases. And what he knows today is that he's losing money on legal fees. Georgia's closer than ever to charges. And his last faint hope of getting reinstated and, and, and putting himself back above the law for four years, that's gone too. 